Hello CIS27. In this video, I'm going to talk about Unit 1 materials. Uh, we're going to cover the notes and the assignments for Unit 1. And I will talk about the tasks that you need to do for Week 1. So in the chapter and in this week, we're going to touch on security domains and goals. Uh, we're going to look at security approaches, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, why are those things important in security? Um, and then I will show you a little bit of commands and how command line is essential in a lot of the things that we do. And then we're going to talk about virtualization and the product. So you are to read chapter one, look at the notes for unit one, uh, watch this lecture video, and also post the reply for the discussion complete unit one assignment and take the practice quiz so that are good that are tasks so um, if you go down to the next page here click next you will find I will post the video on the next page you can view the video within uh, using the YouTube tube app that's embedded in onto the page for the notes you can download the notes um, and if you don't have Office 365, you can, I will post a page for you to access you, where you can download Office uh, 365. As a student, you get a free license or you can use the Office 365 tab on the left here, but you just have to log in using your RCCD account. So you can download the notes to view there. And one of the things that we need to do is to post a discussion for this week. Uh, recently, we know that there's an incident. Uh, Solar Wind had a security incident. And what I want you to do is you, I want you to watch the videos that I posted here and here. And basically, you're going to find out what that incident is about. What I want you to do is to hit reply and then write out the answer for these questions. Provide your name, what area of cybersecurity are you interested in pursuing? Ethical hacking, computer forensic, application analysis, network defense, which area do you want to work in? Second, I want you to put down a few sentences, at least a good paragraph about your perspective about solo wind security incident. What do you think it is? What could it be? Is it a cyber attack? Is it a, a, a warfare tactic? What is our US government doing? And for number three, I want you to answer this question. What should the US government do to address security measures going forward? What do you think the US government should be doing to really address something like this? You can also read the articles. I posted some link for some of the recent article. You can click on this, these links, and it's going to take you to the page. You can read the information. So all you have to do is hit reply. Make sure that you answer these questions and re reply to two of your classmates' response by the end of the week. Okay? So um make sure that we post the discussions and one of our assignments is gonna be on the lecture and it's best that you watch this video look at your notes and answer the questions so i'm going to walk you through the questions as i cover the notes now so in chapter one, chapter one talks about the very basics in security. So we first have to familiarize ourselves with different terminology. One of the things that you're going to hear quite a bit in the industry is going to be use case. And in the use case, what the organization would do is they would look at a use case, which would entail how to be able to recognize the users. We would identify the users, the systems, be able to look at the analysis for could be security implementation. But really in the use case, one of the important 
area is to number one, identify and clarify the requirements to be achieved. So if you are implementing security solutions, you need, you need to take a look at what is required and what are going to be your goals. Then you want to be able to have some kind of common naming convention for your use case. So that way you can categorize them and be able to go back and look at what that use case is about. The use case can help all department understand their responsibility and how the company operate. Because every department will play into the operation of the organization, but it also needs to tie in all the departments. So for example, use case and security would could entail human resource in that we need to do background for the people before they become employees or if they have behavior problem or ethical problems human resource actually is gonna be able to document all of those things so we need to really be able to establish an understanding across different departments in the use case and what are their responsibility um, and that ties back to how we're going to use this type of information to improve our landscape as far as the technical landscape in the organization. The actors, the users, could be employees as users, students in the case of like a college, or could be um, customers as users. The type of systems that we have, the process to complete a specific task. So in the case, if we're looking at um, checkout for customers, what are gonna be the process behind checkout, like an online checkout system or even a store checkout system. And with that, what we can do is we can look at the sub processes and see how we can protect the data that that would be required for the sub processes and the overall process. The precondition, what must occur before the process starts. So going back to our example, if a customer is checking out the product to pay, what would be the precondition? Well, the, the condition would, might be that they have to register themselves as a customer, as a customer. For example, like Amazon, you might be a guest but in order to check out, you might have to input your personal email to be able to register for an account. So there are some precondition in specific process or in the case where if the user is downloading a software, they might have to register for an account or they might have to click accept some kind of level of agreement for that particular software. So there is a precondition before that process can begin. Then you might have trigger, what would be the need to start using the case. And then you might have a post condition where what will happen after the user or specific system triggered the process. So for example, if the, if the user click checkout, what will be the post condition? Uh, will the items go into the cart? How is that data stored on the database? Well, how do we protect that data and to be able to continue to the next step? We would look at the list of steps in sequential order, how it would flow from the beginning to the end and we would look at the alternate flow, what would be the alternate ways to accomplish that same process. So at the beginning, the book talks about the use case and then it goes into confidentiality. So to go to our assignment, the first question asks you, what is the purpose of the use case? And the purpose of a use case is that it helps professional identify and clarify the requirements to achieve a goal 
specifically technical goal from our standpoint in the organization. It could be security goal or it could be development goal in the case where if we are developing certain type of software, it could be a network goal where we want to elevate our network performance through implementation and configuration of our systems um, and so forth. So a use case allow us as professional to identify and clarify the requirements to achieve a specific goal. Now, it the text also goes into the security goals. So in security, what are our goals? And for your entire career as security professional, you will need to remember three things. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CIA. And these areas can be broken into different elements in security. So confidentiality, really we have to take a look at how data is viewed or, or accessed by the authorized user. That means that the people who per, we are permitting to look at the data, right? It could be viewing or using the data. So confidentiality would be how that data is viewed or used by the authorized user. And there is different type of permissions that we can, we can utilize to control the level of usage. Um, and confidentiality is for the organization in some common use case, it has to do with support confidentiality. So use case can be used to support the confidentiality, looking at how data is accessed, looking at how we maintain data, how we classify data, how we transport data, how we how data is transferred from one point to another. So the methods to reinforce or enforce confidentiality would be encryption, using cryptography, changing something that's in plain text to something that's not readable. And this occurs all the time whenever you access resources online, like checking your bank account. The web traffic that, that, that's initiated to authenticate you and to display your banking account is encrypted. When you're using HTTPS um, or in the case where if you wanted to encrypt a file to be able to send that out to an individual and you wanted to make sure that no one else can see that, there's confidentiality. So we can use encryption, we can use access control, like I mentioned earlier, to be able to control files or even system access. So there are two different areas in how we look at access control. We can look at access control as in what's permitted or permission level that tends to be related to files. And when we look at system level, that will be privileges. What is the user, what type of rights does the user have to be able to, to access that system? For example, the rights could be shutting down the system, updating the system, installing software, etc. And another part of confidentiality would be steganography or obfuscation. A way that we can hide data or data is positioned so that way it will be obscure or non-visible to plain sight. Um, and sometimes you would see this with embedded. And now from a user standpoint or a protector standpoint, you can embed or archive your data a certain way where it's not going to be transparent. Um, however, from the attacker standpoint or the unauthorized user or the, the bad guy standpoint, 
data can or malware can also be embedded in different types of files and to be able to, so this practice is carried both way but with confidentiality the important takeaway from this is how we want to implement the C to protect the data and to make sure that that data is properly accessed by the authorized user. So here it touches on encryption controls and seconography, the practice of hiding data, access control. And in access control, we'll cover more in the next chapter, but in access control, the elements of access control would be identification, recognize the user, identifying the user, authenticating the user using passwords, biometrics, etc., and authorizing the user or the system, giving them privilege or access permissions to a certain resource. Now, there are different ways that we can manage access control, possibly through passwords, biometrics, access tokens, and then we can also grant or restrict access, and we want to follow the rules of least, least privilege. So for question two, we can put down that CIA or confidentiality, integrity, and availability are going to be the security goals. And make sure that you remember this for the final exam and quizzes. Now for question three in the assignment, it asks, identify and explain the methods to achieve confidentiality. So one of the important things that we cannot forget is to make sure that people, users, customers, people, even the people in your household need to not disclose information to unauthorized entity. The scammers, the people who call to pretend and they social engineer, they, they trick people to give it, give personal information like social security number, passwords, um, etc. So make sure that we train the user not to disclose in confidential information to unauthorized entity. There are different level of confidential information. If you work for government or a uh, different agency, you probably heard about this, but train the user to not disclose important information to unauthorized entity. Could be over the phone, in person, in email, etc. We need to implement access control or permission control. So permission control ties with access control. And that really, we can allow the user to view, to read, write, to edit, to download, to execute. So different permission can be managed to make sure that different level of user have different access. So that way we can protect the resources, the confidentiality of the data that is being permitted or not. Uh, use least privilege policy. So the rule is that we want it to go to the least level. So for a, for a person that needs access, we can see, okay, uh, does that person need to, to view the data? Uh, does this person need to, absolutely need to edit the data or write the data um, or even send out the data, etc. So we want to make sure that least privilege is first. We wanted to start with the least and then if the user needs more they can request and we can we can look at whether the request is adequate so least privilege first and so for number three those are the some of the three areas that we need to look at when we're looking at how we can achieve confidentiality Going back to the notes, and the notes talk about hiding data, you can also include that. Uh, granting and restricting access, we touch on that. The next part we're going to touch on is integrity. 
and integrity provides assurance that the data does not change it stay intact it has integrity so from the point where if i create a file and i wanted to send you the file i wanted to email that to you by the time you receive it if it has integrity it would not have any changes now in the case where if somebody intercept that data and modify that data, then it would have lost its integrity. So no modification, no tampering, no data corruption. And in other cases, you might have malware that would impact the, the data, that would change the state of that data. So in such case, it then would have lost its integrity. So now, we can have defined integrity and some of the things that we can use to make sure that our our data doesn't change and it has integrity is hashing hashing is a series of number that would be created using an algorithm against that data so when we look at a file let's say a text file we can utilize a tool to be able to generate a hash value and this hash value and you do see this a lot when you're downloading from different website it gives you a, a, a hash value and you would use this hash value to compare once your your file is downloaded so if it matches exactly then that means that your file has not been tampered with during the download process it has not been changed since its original release to download um, and so forth so this is important because we want to make sure that the data stays as it is right throughout the process of transmitting it via the web or transferring through attachments or even downloading in some cases and if the data doesn't change the hash value matches or it stays the same so hash comparison is is used to look at the integrity of the data um, and so if we do it if, if we have a hash value today and a year from now, if we look at the hash value, if the data hasn't changed, it would be exactly the same. So we use it to verify transferable data or download, and you see, you see this a lot on website. The second thing that you can use is digital signature and certificates and non-repudiation. So digital signature is used for the integrity and the, the authentication it would say that that the, the user generated this this file this document by signing it and it validates that this particular per it's authentic to the person and it has integrity verify the sender and the authenticity of the data and so when you digitally sign that, you're saying you are who you are when you send this. And if the person receives it, then it's authentic and it has integrity. Uh, Non-repudiation, it validates the time that's sent. So it puts a timestamp onto that piece of data saying that at this time, this was signed and this was created. So. Digital signature would utilize certificate, system certificate, or that could be distributed over the servers, uh, certificate authority in the case of Microsoft servers. And when it goes through the process, you would see non-repudiation where the timestamp is there. The system timestamp is used to say that at this time, this event occurs. So hashing and digital signature is commonly found and sometimes you would see this also incorporated with certificates. And if you download and use like apps, sometimes that would also require a certificate. We'll touch back on that. So in question four, it asks you, 
identify and explain the methods to achieve integrity. That will be hashing, digital signature, certificates, and timestamp. So those are the four things that generally use to assure uh, integrity for data. Okay. And you can also find that on our notes on page two. The last goal is availability. And availability just means that we gotta make sure our data and our system, our services, our networks are gonna be available. And in security, we wanted to strive for the five nines. 99.999999% availability. That means that your database have to be available, your network connection have to be available, your servers have to be available. Your system generally is needs to be 99.9999% available, available. So what does that mean for us? We need to make sure that our system have redundancy and tolerance. So redundancy just means that there's duplication in critical system. Meaning that if I have an authentication server, I got to make sure that there's a failover server to, to support it in case, to use in case the first, the primary server die. Um, that means that we have to also back up our data. That means that we have to have alternate connection to make sure that there's network connection. Let's think about communication company like AT&T or Verizon. Uh, in their cases, they gotta make sure that the network is available for the users to use their smartphone to communicate. So there definitely needs to be redundancy in satellite systems, cell towers, etc. So additionally, we want to make sure that the service continue without interruption. Uh, could be email services, could be web registration services. So there could be a lot of different things that the business need for operation. We need to also remove single point failure, meaning that if we only have that one system, right, that could be taken down by our attacker, or you know power failure um, we want to make sure that there are multiple types multiple of that same system is enabled and so that way we don't have a single point failure because single point failure means that it's that we can definitely become a target and if somebody take us down they can go to that one point and bring down our network or our system or our servers etc so some of the common redundancies that we see for the next question is your RAID. So this is an array of this. So we have to use two or more drives um, and it's often used for data storage and even backup in some sense. So the, the, this redundancy allows us to use different type. RAID 1, which is mirror, we duplicate the data so it's exactly the same set of data on a second disk and so you have to use two or more hard drives raid 5 which uses striping and parity that means that it stripe across the disk so it writes faster and it also has parity for checking for error this tends to be high in performance and some reliability but also in cost you have to use three or more disk drives. For RAID 10, which is a combination of mirror and striping, many companies prefer to use RAID 10 in that it has duplicate of the data and striping is fast. So that means it writes from this one to this two back and forth. Um, so in RAID 10, we have to have multiple disks, of course, at least two, in the case where if you one of the disks goes down you have you you might be able to you you would lose your data but if you have more disks you will be able to survive in the case that your system crash and lost data uh we would have failover clusters 
of servers that will be a group of servers that would we would bring up in case the other the primary servers fail or crash we would use virtualization in, in the case where we would have cloud infrastructure to be able to implement as alternate sources um, another way that we would have redundancy is to use load balancing and that means that we would use multiple servers to support a single service so if you use youtube google they do this they they do load balancing where it would be able to distribute out the load across multiple servers to really support something like upload and and showing this particular video for example or even using social network websites so load balancing is essential and you can configure this to be able to you know load across different servers or network appliances etc then you have site redundancy uh, we might have alternate sites in the case where if there's disaster that happens uh, a hot site means that it's available 24 7 so many companies will not have hot sites unless they have a lot of investment money to be able to build it hot site would have all the equipment and possibly operation uh, so people can go to the this hot site to be able to pick up wherever they left off cold site would have some equipment um, and then the data and personnel would be moved in the case that it's needed so in the case of disasters like earthquake fire um, even warfare a cold site would be a room where they would move the people employees to and be able to bring the equipment in and and start working again a warm site would be a little bit of equipment uh, there might be some servers that that's there or systems that's there and then it needs to be maintained now lately we do see a lot of company using mobile warm site meaning that they would have equipment on wheels and they would be able to use a 18 wheeler truck to bring it to different location physically um, to be able to bring up the business once it's get interrupted so an area that's very important for us is backup we want to make sure that we duplicate the data so that way we can restore it in the case of corruption deletion or errors uh, that could be human or system errors depend now many companies would use alternate power um, UPS as what you know uninterrupted power supply usually that would just be a battery and these don't last more than two hours so a company would invest in something like a generator or even solar powered systems nowadays Okay, so a, a thing that they also need to maintain is cooling system. Servers and computers like to run cooler, so making sure that we would have the proper cooling system, ventilation, air conditioning, and in some cases that would be connected to some kind of controller, right? In the case, if you heard about Target, that's how they hacked into Target long ago, years ago but now that has changed. So air conditioning system, uh, raised floors to make sure our servers are nice and happy and cool. We would want to patch, run updates, fixes to reduce vulnerability and making sure that our systems are up to date. And even um, firmware for some of your IOT devices, etc. So in some hospital, they use IOT devices for, you know, patients, uh, heart monitoring systems, health detection systems. So we want to make sure that we run patches. So for the next question, we can put down that to really improve the systems availability and services, we want to first remove single point failure, remove SPF. We want to make sure that we have backups to our data and we want to have failover system in place. We want to have redundancy. 
we would often install patches and updates to remove the vulnerabilities in our system. So those are some of the things that you can put down for the next question, number five. Then in the next part, we talk about risk and how risk plays an important role in security. A risk is a possibility or a likelihood that a threat exploiting an, a vulnerability which could result in a loss. Now, in most of the cases, you would see negatively impacted risk, and then there are some cases you would have positively impacted risk. So in security, we need to make sure that we manage our risk, and we wanted to look at what would be the possibility that a threat like a malware, a person, an attacker that could re that could cause some kind of loss. So a threat is a circumstance or an event that could potentially compromise confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So an example of a threat could be disgruntled employee somebody that didn't get a race and they get upset and they delete data or sell data uh, from your company. An attacker, a threat could also be natural disaster, earthquake, fire, tornadoes. A threat could also be malware, a Trojan, a bomb, a virus. Vulnerability is a weakness in a hardware software configuration or the user. The user can be vulnerable because they can be tricked to give out information. Software can be vulnerable that it has bugs and somebody can utilize that bug to take advantage of your system. Weakness in hardware, weakness in software, weakness in configuration, would be under vulnerability. So to answer the next question, we would say that a risk is defined as the possibility or a likelihood of a threat exploiting a vulnerability resulting in a loss. An example of a risk could be employee leaking sensitive data. The risk could be malware being downloaded in your system or data corruption via malware or an attacker accessing your network devices and steal data or leak data. So a risk can range in a higher scope. We, we would have a large range for what will be considered risk in a network or system environment. For question seven, it asks you to provide an example of a threat and vulnerability. So threats could be malware attacker. It could be an, an internal threat would be an employee a disgruntled employee. External threat might be an attacker, somebody that's accessing your network not, not being authorized. A vulnerability would be unpatched software, unlocked door physically, so if somebody leaves the door open, or people just simply have lack of training. That becomes vulnerable because if they are not knowledgeable of certain security practice, they can be vulnerable to triggery, like social engineering. Um, unlocked door to server room could be left open and somebody can get into the room and be able to take down the system or take data or steal the physical equipment. 
So those are the two things that you can provide example for, threats and vulnerability, and you can find that also on the notes. So for question eight, it asks you about security incident. And in the security incidents, we can have different types of security incidents. Uh, data theft could be an incident. Malware, uh, malware download and destroying our data could be an incident. Employees stealing our data and selling our data could be an incident. So we need to respond to the incidents and making sure that we would mitigate some of the risks and prepare ourselves so um, some company would look at how we would implement different types of control. There are two types of control. There are administrative control, which is used through management methods, policies, reinforcing the rules. And then we have logical system control where we would be able to configure and protect our system and be able to elevate the security uh, practices through our system configuration. So administrative control touches on awareness and training, making sure that people are knowledgeable and following the standards. Uh, and Within administrative control, you would have configuration management and change management. And these two areas, these two topics will come up on Security Plus and other security certifications. So make sure that you are knowledgeable of configuration and change management. Configuration management uses baseline to ensure that systems start in security hardened state. So baseline, we're looking at the minimal level on where it should be. So for example, like a firewall, it should block, right? Uh, a certain type of traffic could be threats, right? Malware traffic, attack traffic. Um, or it could accept only, we can whitelist, accept only, uh, you know, our employee access traffic. So configuration management would use the baselines to ensure that the system is hardened. Change management ensure that changes don't result in unintended configuration error. So these two always go hand in hand. Change management making sure that con configuration there's no misconfiguration. Okay. So in order to have appropriate adequate effective configuration management you have to have effective change management and so what we would end up is that we wanted to make sure that we implement control also uh, above the logical control is physical control our locks fire alarm fire extinguisher uh, lighting, signs, fences, surveillance system, those are some of the control for the physical building, the physical system, the physical assets, even people in our working environment. And then we also have preventative control. So a lot of the, the, the security approach thus far has always been reactive. Right. What would you do in the case where would this would happen? Uh, now, if we started taking more incentive to implement control for preventative prevention, that way our incident would not occur as often. Something like hardening your system, making sure that your applications are patched, and the bugs are fixed, making sure that we change the default configuration and configure it to something that's not default, that would be have better security measures, having security awareness training regularly, 
making sure that we have security guards or physical control to prevent and deter attacks, like having a surveillance system. Implement change management to make sure that we don't intend, we don't have any unintended outages or misconfiguration. We wanted to have policies for, you know, disabling the account or even when people leave or retire from the company, we wanted to make sure that we have policies in place, rules to make sure that we disable the employee when they're no longer there. So preventative controls are essential as well compared to detective control, which is more on the reactive aspect, such as monitoring logs, react to something that could be abnormal, trend analysis, audit our security, having surveillance for our system, and also have detection for motion like an alarm. So detective control is good, but it's always going to be reactive where you would you would react to the incident as it occurred. Then we have corrective control is when we go back and fix the problem. It's already been impacted. So we have to reverse the incident or fix the problem that has occurred. So something that we can use is intrusion prevention system so that way it detects attacks and it modifies the environment to block it from happening. We would have backups so that way we could recover from our data loss. So corrective control relies on a lot of different type of appliances and also practices. Then we also should have deterrent control to discourage the, the individuals from causing an incident. Cable locks so that way system theft doesn't occur, deter system theft. Hardware locks or we would have even camera system that will also be a deterrent. Compensating control would be alternative control when the, prim the primary control is not feasible. Something like a one-time password to use, um, and that would only be for one-time use. So security control are very important in all aspects technical, administrative, and or physical. So now, in the next question, it talks about incident. Which of the following options are considered to be a security incident? A, the user clicked the unknown URL, which takes him to an ad of a car dealership. So that's, there's a little bit of adware there. It's not truly a security incident. B, CEO laptop is lost at the coffee shop. No data was recently backed up. So technically B is, it is a system loss, right? But you have to think about how that's gonna be ranking. Uh, for certification exam, a lot of the times they're going to give you very closely related scenario and you have to make sure that which one is really an incident. So a CEO laptop is lost at a coffee shop. No, the data was recently back up. We don't know if the data is, is jeopardized, right? But we know that the data is backed up. So this is a lower level of an incident compared to C. C is a higher level incident. Ransomware is downloaded on the network. No file is accessible after the event. It's already occurred. An incident happened that you got ransomware and all the files are corrupted. So we would mark C for number eight. D, server room door was open and no entry log was recorded. It is also a smaller incident, but it would not be at a high level as C. So for nine, nine asks, 
what type of controls can be implemented to mitigate risk? Earlier, I touched on technical control. We can configure security appliance like firewall. We can have password protection account, password protected accounts. We can configure our system to uh, to in to scan for malware. Uh, and then you have administrative control. Train users, create policy, implement procedures. And then there are additional control like preventative control, detective control, etc. But the two areas of control that you often see that would be encompasses all the other types of control would be technical and administrative. And the type of controls you can find on in our notes on page three and four. So why do we really want to implement control, administrative and technical control? We wanted to make sure that we protect our assets, which are resources for the organization, people or assets, systems or assets, buildings or assets, Right, our network appliances are assets. And so in the industry, we would rely on NIST documentation SP800, which gives you a guideline on how to break down some of the areas of control. So in the Cascade internship that I'm currently running, one of the companies had approached us about fulfilling compliant for the Department of Defense because they're contracted with the Department of Defense. And our interns have to rely on the NIST documentation, SB 800 version 2, to be able to look at the type of controls and the areas that the company would need to be able to meet the compliance requirement. So when you don't know what type of control is needed you would go to the resource which is provided by our government nis.gov and you would find the publication that would give you recommendation of different control implementation and you would follow the guidelines and be able to look at your existing resources and how to implement it Next, we're going to talk about virtualization. And in cybersecurity, virtualization is utilized quite a bit for testing purposes, uh, for sandboxing, for, you know, pen penetration testing in the network to really see what kind of measures that's needed to for further improvement. But virtualization is also used in all aspects of technology. Uh, companies could use it to, to archive data. A company would be able to use it to, for load balancing, uh, for servers. Uh, and in many data centers, virtualization is implemented to save costs. So instead of having thousands and thousands of servers, what we can do is we can use hundreds of servers to be able to virtualize thousands of servers. So what it would do is it would take the host machine, which is the physical system itself, and be able to treat it, use storage locations like drives to be able to make it into multiple machines from one host machines. And we need to familiarize ourselves with different terminology. For example, hypervisor. Hypervisor is a software that creates, runs, and manage the virtual machine. So some of the example for the hypervisor would be VMware. VMware produce a whole suite of different type of virtualization products. So a hypervisor in a sense, VMware provides hypervisor software that creates, runs, managed virtual machine, like vSphere or VMware Player. 
player is free or VMware desktop. So another product that you would see is Microsoft Hyper-V in such that we can use a server to manage virtualized machines. Um, Oracle also have Oracle VM and also we can use the free product which is VirtualBox. And there are different types of hypervisor. Type 1 which uses directory on the system hardware itself and sometimes they would be referred to as bare metal hypervisors. Then type 2 hypervisors, it uses software within the host operating system like Microsoft Hyper-V or VMware Player or VirtualBox that will be type 2 hypervisors. Now a host is a physical system that's hosting the VMware or the v virtual machines. So if I'm running my laptop, I can install the hypervisor which is VMware Player or VirtualBox, and I will, my laptop will become a host, and I can use the storage in the laptop or external hard drives to be able to create virtual machines and access virtual machine through my operating system, which then classify as I'm using Type 2 hypervisor. Now, the operating system that's running as a virtual machine could be Microsoft or Linux. Then we would call that as a guest OS, which is the operating system that's running on the host machine as virtual machines. Now, the last term here talks about elasticity and scalability. We can resize the capacity for the load and elasticity just means that it's going to be flexible and scalable to resize based on the need of our load. So in virtualization, really the determination of this is based on the return of investment. Many company chooses virtualization and even virtualization in the cloud, uh, which is a set of servers that you lease through a service provider like Amazon AWS, Google, or Microsoft Azure. So it's really depending on the return of investment. And with cloud infrastructure, we would see that there are different scale for cloud. And with that, we can optimize our cloud using virtualization. Um, some of the terminology, you would also see application cell or container virtualization uh, that is used to run services or application within application cell. You often see this with virtualized environment in infra cloud infrastructure. Uh, this use less resources, it's more efficient, and often we would use traditional type 2 hypervisor um, and sometimes you would hear it as container virtualization. Now we can create snapshots or copy of the VM at a moment in time. Meaning that let's say that I am working on a design or I'm configuring a certain type of system. We can pause it using an we can take a snapshot of it with a certain type of design or certain applications for example and we can use it as a backup so that way we can have a reference of how that design is or how that how many applications we have installed for that server through that snapshot <coughs> and the next part is going to be VDI and VDE, and this goes over how we connect to the server using the desktop operating system, and we can have a customized desktop to save data for the virtualized environment. We can have certain icon, applications, etc. And when we save the virtual machine, we save it as VM or virtual machines, 
We can store it on a, a, a hard drive. Uh, a, if you have a flash drive that's large enough, you can store it there. You can have it on external hard drive. And we can easily copy it as a folder or a directory from one location to another. So VM escape is an attack that allows the attacker to access the host system from the virtual system. Before, long ago, we were not knowledgeable in how this attack could, could be generated. But yes, somebody can attack a system through the virtual environment. And this is what's called a VM escape. VM sprawl is what we would say a mismanaged virtual machine or a group of virtual machines not using the proper policies, configurations, rules, and it just utilizes a lot of the resources. So this is what's called the VM sprawl. Now in Windows environment, you can use command lines known as command prompt. So you can do CMD like this. Or in Linux, if you're using Linux, you would use terminal. Like if you're using, uh, you know, your Chromebook, you would use terminal. If you're using an Apple system, like an iMac or a MacBook, you can also, you would also use terminal. The command Commands are, are different between Windows and Linux and Apple is close. Your, your terminal in Apple systems and Mac OS is very close to Linux OS, but sometimes you would see different commands. So in this class, we would utilize a lot of different types of command to, to troubleshoot, to detect and to prevent. So something like ping, ping is the same in Windows environment and also in, in terminal for Linux. So if I open my command prompt, I simply just type in the search bar on the bottom and I would do CMD or command prompt and I would open this up. Now in command prompt, I can change the properties of it, such as how I want it to look, right? So if I wanted larger fonts so you can see, I can click that. And then I can also change color and the pop-up text on however I want that to be. So once you configure that, you can start using it. Now, a way that we can use our command is to use the help feature. So in help, you simply type in help and it gives you the list of the common commands. And in the notes, I included some of the networking commands that you would use. So something like ping, if you type in ping alone, it would not know what ping, what you want it to do. So ping needs to include options. So when I type in ping, it tells me usage with ping. I can use ping dash T, right? What does dash T mean? So it gives you a list of the options. So when you use certain commands, some, some commands utilize options. Um, we would ping a type of address. We would ping like an IP address. We can also ping over a certain number of time. We can count the ping. We can ping only version six of the IP address and the computer would use an IP address uh, to be able to connect to the network. And each system has to have a different IP address. So we can ping a certain host. So there's different options that you can ping there. So in the notes, I talk about a little bit about ping. So for example, if you ping 192.168.1.1, which is often the default IP for your home router, unless you change it. So if we do a ping 
0.1.1. This is an IP version 4 address. And if we set this to ping, if it is successful, it would reply. If it is not successful, it would tell you request timeout. It's not responding. And in Windows environment, it would send out four requests. As you can see, the, the first four is timed out and it would say that it would be timed out. So you can, what you can do is you can practice pinging at home and be able to see the results. So this is my command prompt. And you can also check out how you would do that in terminal in Linux or Mac. Now, if we do a ping 127.0.1, this is a loop address, meaning that I'm pinging myself without knowing my IP address and I call this a boomerang address. That means that it goes and it requests back into the system. It's asking, hey, am I connected, right? If I don't know the IP address of my laptop or my system that I'm using, I can also use what we call a loopback address in version four. When you see this, you know that it's gonna call home. It's gonna use its own address. It's gonna reboot boomerang back to its its own address. So I'm pinging myself by doing a loopback address 127.0.0.1. And here you can see that I received four reply. Unlike before, it it's timed out. That means it could not reach it. In this one, because I'm connected, it shows that the my system reply four times because there were four requests to see, are you connected, are you connected, are you connected? So ping is used to determine if a system is connected, right? And in some network, ping command is disabled because ping uses ICMP, which is a protocol. And there's a form of attack, the Smurf attack, that would take down the system by by occupying it, by continue to ping it many, many times. So in some cases, you would see that network administrator and security administrator would disable the ping command because they don't want that form of attack to, to, to take down their servers or their system. But now you can see when I use the loopback address, the 127 address, I received four respond from my own system. So you can also use that to check out your own computer. And I'm using Windows 10 with command prompt. So going back to our, our question for question 10, what are the benefits of virtualization? I mentioned earlier that we reduce costs by virtualizing our machine. We can take one physical system and make it into many using hypervisor. Uh, we'll be able to use it for testing, for simulating even applications or, you know, uh, different type of design. We can use it for training. So virtualization has a lot of different type of benefits from reducing costs to, you know, testing, simulating, and training. And that would be for number 10. For 11, I want you to follow the steps A, B, and C, and D. And in each one, you will have to answer the questions. I want you to check out your own personal information on the web. I wanted to see if you are visible on the web. And I want you to be able to determine what type of data is confidential? How do you use public data, right? So these steps walk you through on how to use the website to find someone information online. Not only that, when you go to locatepeople.org, it, it talks about how on this particular page in that section, what can you do and cannot do with the data? So you have to 
really understand how public data is used and what is regulated with the public data, what would be considered unlawful, right? Like cyber stalking. And we'll talk about regulation down the line, but look at that section and answer the question. And then for the last part, based on what you found from this website, how should organization protect someone's privacy? What is your personal opinion on that? What should they do? What type of public data should be private? Do you think that all our public data should be public data, such as tax, your, your property tax information, your, your, your birth certificate, your death certificate, your, uh, you know, court, court data, right? Like criminal history and criminal information. So some of this data is available to the public and people can request your data. However, is, is, do you think that that's valid and what type of public data should be private? So I want you to answer these questions and then include it in the document to submit it in Canvas. So once you complete this document with all the answers and all the completed steps, save it. And then what you would do is you would click submit on this page and attach the document and submit to me so I can grade it. So that will be our assignment for this week. Please read the ch chapter and also continue with the notes. Um, here it talks a little bit about how you can. And the example that I use here in, in the command prompt is for Windows okay another thing that I wanted to show you is to use tracer before we end the video so we can also do trace RT which is trace route and trace route we can use a website so let's say we can do google.com and what this does is it takes my traffic from my network and it brings it to it's gonna follow the traffic it's like we're putting a camera system on this car and it's gonna go from my house to down the street to many streets and it's gonna get to the Google server so what you can see is often you would start with the system and the network that's connected to the system and then it's going to venture out to different servers and here we look at ip version 6 and here is the the server for google.com it would say the information here and its public address. Now in a system, you would have two type of addresses. You would have the private IP address and the public IP address. And our public IP address is what's used to forward the traffic back and forth when you're using the web. But the private IP address is used internally inside the network inside your home like the 192.168.1.x um, for your printers your tablets your tv etc your public ip address is used to pass to forward to different communication company your, your at&t verizon um, charter uh, time warner spectrum uh, Cox, etc. So, and public IP addresses are registered and maintained by different by organizations or associations, and we will touch on this. Um, if you take my CIS 40A in the next semester, you would find that we would dive deeper into IP subnetting, configuring uh, network devices, etc. Focus more on network appliances. So make sure that we check out our notes, read through the chapters, uh, you know, touch on different protocol, go through the concept, answer the questions, and complete unit one. 
At the end of the week, make sure you take the quiz, um, which entails the content that we touch on in our assignments and in our notes. This concludes my video for CIS 27A Unit 1 Lecture and Unit 1 Assignment.